We're going to continue our discussion of machine translation, this time talking about neural machine translation. Neural machine translation has some advantages compared to phrase-based machine translation. The first is that you can train directly on the sentence pairs. This is often called a sequence-to-sequence -sequence task. We're going directly from sentences in the source language to sentences in the target language. And a lot of the intermediate modeling steps that we had for our other machine translation models, like alignments and discovering the phrases, are gone. And this makes it a lot more generalizable. You can translate source language to target language with pretty much the same code and models. You don't have to do a lot of fine-tuning by hand in terms of programming. And the output that you get is a lot more fluid. Now you might think that this is an advantage. If you're getting better output, doesn't that mean that the model is better? Well, with phrase-based models, when you had really crazy output, that often meant that the system did something wrong and you couldn't understand what it said. That meant that it screwed up, you shouldn't trust the translation. When neural systems make mistakes, they often produce perfectly reasonable sentences in the target language, but you have no idea that a mistake was made. So the problems when they appear are a little bit more insidious. But it is the accepted status quo for state-of-the-art machine translation. It works well if you have enough data, and it works better than the phrase-based models that it replaced. And it can be put on things like phones uh, much more easily as a scaled-down model. So it's more portable, it's fast, it works well. And the way that we do neural translation is using one of the tools that we've seen before, an RNN. And so in the RNN, you have a source and target sentence pair, like a sentence that is, I'm a student in English and in French. And we take the English sentence and put it into an RNN. And this will look very familiar. You have the hidden states on top. You have the word embeddings down below. And at the end of the RNN, the final state of the RNN encodes what the sentence is about. So we call this part of the RNN the encoder. And the final hidden layer of this RNN has represented the meaning of the sentence. And we're now going to take that hidden representation and we're going to put it through another RNN and we're going to generate the French sentence. And we first do that by having the output decode the sentence. So we'll call this part of the RNN the decoder. In this part of the decoder, we start with an input symbol that marks the beginning of the French sentence. And from that boundary marker input, the hidden layer needs to then output the French word je. And from that French word, we're now going to go forward in time. And the next input to the decoder is going to be that first French word je. And we'll continue that process. Uh, given the input je, you then need to output the next word from the corresponding hidden layer, in this case, sui, and you continue that. So uh, that goes through until you reach the end of the sentence. And at the end, the decoder needs to say, hey, I'm done translating the sentence. Let's stop. And so again, you have another boundary marker saying that the decoder is finished. And this is how you can train your RNN. You have the English sentence, you have the French sentence. At every time point, the French sentence needs to generate the next French word from its hidden layer. Everything is great. Backprop through the sentence using your favorite deep learning framework, and everything should work out. Now, what happens when you want to go to translate a sentence at test time? At test time, the English part works just the same as it did before. You have the encoder, it encodes a sentence in a single final layer, and then the decoder starts off with the boundary marker saying, hey, we need to begin translating a sentence from whatever the hidden layer of the last state of the English sentence was. And then 
you need to make a prediction. So given the hidden layer of the first word of the target sentence, in this case fringe, you then need to pick one of the words. So here you're going to take the hidden layer and put it through something like a softmax to choose one of the fringe words to output. In this case, maybe you don't get it right. Maybe you predict moi instead of je, accusative versus nominative. And then you're going to take that word moi, and that's going to be the input to the next time step in your RNN. So then you generate the next word, that becomes the input to the next stage of the decoder, and you keep doing that until you, in your decoder, generate the boundary marker, and then you're done. Now, you can't just do this greedily because you may end up in a garden path like we saw before. So you need to do something like the Viterbi decoding that we talked about before, or a beam search to find the high scoring sentences in terms of the output probabilities of each of these words. So you take all of the output probabilities of your French words, you multiply them together or add them together in log space, and then you get the final overall score. You need to search for the sequence that gives you a high overall score not just selecting greedily through the sentence. Now, this works for short sentences in simple languages, but it doesn't always work for any language pair. Languages are complicated. How do you deal with some of the craziness that you see in the real world? Now, some of the areas where these models will fail are on out-of-vocabulary words, on languages with complicated morphology, and when you have overly long sentences. For out of vocabulary words, if you see like a name that you haven't seen before, you need to do something like transliteration to get the word in the source language into what it should look like in the target language. And you can either directly copy or do some sort of transliteration. This has been standard even in phrase translation models. For complicated morphology, the softmax that you're doing on the decoder becomes overwhelmed, and it doesn't know the right output word to generate, and so here you need to have something like a character level model to encode the morphology of the word directly, rather than treating the words as embeddings. And so you need to be able to figure out how the morphology of a single word will affect the translation directly. And for longer sentences, something like an RNN will fail because it is trying to cram an entire sentence into one vector, and that doesn't work. A vector doesn't have the capacity to encode a very long sentence. And here we're going to do something very similar to what we did for phrase-based models. We're going to use more context to translate each of the target language words, and we're going to do this through something called attention. So attention is a popular mechanism in deep learning to figure out what areas of the input are important for our output. So let's see an example of this translating from Chinese to English. Now let's say that we have a sentence like zhi shi, jiu shi, liang. This roughly means knowledge is power, and if we want to translate this into English, we're going to do something very similar on the encoder. Each of the Chinese characters has a corresponding hidden state, and we pass through the sentence until we have generated all of the hidden states for each character of the source sentence. Let's feed into it, this is exactly like we had before, and now we have a representation of the source sentence. But we're not just going to use the final hidden layer as our representation. We're going to our English sentence using any of the hidden states that we want, but we need to figure out which hidden states are the ones we should be using. So let's start our English sentence with hidden state. So this is like we were doing before, but that hidden state is going to be generated using some subset of the source sentence hidden layers. And we're going to focus on the first two characters, and then we output 
a single English word, again using a softmax layer on top of our hidden state in the decoder, and then we output something like knowledge. We move on to the next word that we're going to translate into English. And here we're focusing on the middle two characters in Chinese, jiu shi. And notice that we're not just using those two words entirely. Unlike in phrase-based models where one phrase correspond entirely to uh, another phrase, uh, some of the information is leaking out. So there are little strands of attention going from word in English to what was the subject of the Chinese sentence. And so this is important because you don't have subject-verb agreement in Chinese, but you do in English. So to figure out what the verb should be, should it be is, should it be are, to figure that out, you need to look at more of the sentence than just the verb in Chinese. And so you can take that into account and figure out that the next word is going to be is. And then finally, you translate the last word as power, focusing on the final two characters in Chinese. And again, you can generate a boundary marker to say, hey, I finished translating this sentence. And so attention is a powerful mechanism that allows you to figure out when you're translating one word in the target language, which words in the source language are important for making sure that you get that translation right. And this is typically implemented by having a probability distribution over the input characters, and you learn which patterns of attention are most effective for giving you the correct downstream prediction, and you train it, as before, with backpropagation. So One of the nice deep things learning for machine learning translation, for machine is, translation that is that we have implementations of machine translation, translation in most of the most popular deep learning popular frameworks. Deep learning frameworks. So, so you can go out, so can download, go the out download the models, and try it out yourself. Try it out yourself. And one of the things and that we'll be, talking, things about we'll be in talking about in future classes future is some classes of the more complicated, more complicated techniques that we can, that we can use for training. This is an active area of research. We don't know what the right, answer, what the right is. answer is. Things are in active things development. Are in active development. And, and how do you deal with how do you when you have low resources, resources in a particular language? You want to translate from Uyghur to Yiddish. You don't have a lot of parallel text. How do you do that effectively? And and this is an active area of research. Area of research. Neural, networks Neural networks are very hungry are for very data. Hungry for how data. do you compensate, how do you compensate for, that for that when you don't when have you don't as have much data as you would have for, say, English and Chinese?